All right, let's now talk about India's Gagan Yatri Group Captain Shubhanshu Shukla, who's returned to Earth. The SpaceX crew capsule named Grace has successfully splashed down off the coast of California near San Diego. This happened yesterday. It brought back Group Captain Shubhanshu Shukla, all of the fellow crew members, back to Earth. After this historic mission to the International Space Station, Shubhanshu Shukla has made the entire country proud by becoming the first Indian to visit the orbiting space laboratory. Right, the crew capsule splashed down at 3 p.m. IST. Group Captain Shukla was helped out of the spacecraft. Just look at those visuals. Everyone was all smiles. All of this took place 15 minutes later. Shukla is scheduled to return to Delhi on August 17th, so in a little more than a month from now. That was all announced by Union Minister Jitendra Singh. Group Captain Shukla is only the second Indian ever. You're going to keep hearing that fact to visit space after Wing Commander Rakesh Sharma all the way back in 1984. He's the first Indian to set foot on the $150 billion International Space Station. And this achievement marks a significant milestone in India's space program overall. The entire country has been congratulating Group Captain Shukla on this incredible feat. And as we, as a country, continue to push boundaries in space exploration, we look forward to many such achievements in the future. Now, joining us to break all of this down, we're very excited to have on Mr. Mike Massimo. He's a former NASA astronaut himself. He's a senior advisor. Hello, sir. He's a senior advisor of the space program at the Interpret Sea, Air and Space Museum. Let's just go over to him. Mike, it's lovely to have you on. Tell us first, the Axiom 4 crew, they're back on Earth. If we could just ask you, zooming out a little bit about the big picture, how does the commercialization of space, so what Axiom is hoping to do is do exactly that, their space goals, how does it impact the future of space exploration and research according to you? Well, I think, I think the Axiom missions, particularly uh, the last couple have been uh, have been uh, uh, really successful missions and and great missions because it wasn't just individuals going to space. The last two missions, uh, it was countries sending astronauts to space. In the case of India, and Anne, it's been a long time since they had an astronaut sent to space, and it's also for the other countries as well, Poland and Hungary and other countries that have participated. So it's a and these are professional astronauts that are going. These aren't just tourists. So. I think that the uh, these types of missions where you see uh, have legitimate astronauts, people who are either uh, professional astronauts representing their country or representing um, a company, commercial astronauts, I think these are great missions. They they get science done, they, they do some great research, uh, but they also do great things for their countries uh, representing their, their various countries in space. So. I, I, I'm really pleased the way the last uh, the, this last mission went. I'm very happy for for India for getting a, getting an, another person into space, and it's been quite a while. and And I hope that these types of missions continue. I think they're great. Oh yes, in India, it's all been about Shubhanshu Shukla, and I think we'll continue to be like that for a while. But Mike, you've been part of two space shuttle missions. Tell us what are the biggest differences between a commercial space mission like Axiom 4 and a traditional NASA mission? I think um, in this case, uh, I, I think the, it's very similar to NASA missions um, that we used to fly due to the length, science missions that we would fly for, for just a couple of weeks because these missions were you know, just more or less two weeks in length, the Axiom missions. The, the typical NASA mission now on space station lasts usually about six months, the expedition, yeah. so they're much longer. Um, but other than that, I, I, you know, they're, they're similar in that the objectives are to do research that is, that is beneficial. Uh, in, in this case, uh, since they were representing their countries and not going for necessarily a commercial company, um, that the, the research is very similar to the research that NASA does trying to do things that would help in industry applications, but also basic research that will help life on planet Earth and, and increase our understanding of, of uh, the cosmos and, and our, our history and in, uh, in how our, our, our uh, planet and how people have developed and how we can continue to explore space. So a lot of basic science research that can help us not only to continue to explore, but to help, uh, help life here on planet Earth. So I think in the 
in the objectives. I think they're very, these, this last mission in particular, I think was very similar to what NASA missions have as their objectives. The, the length was different though. Instead of going for six months, these missions were about two weeks in time. Over 60 experiments have been conducted by Axiom Force crew in the last 18 days. According to you, what are the big breakthroughs that can be expected from these experiments? Just in terms of, you know, both Earth-based medicine, future space exploration. Well, I think for the Earth-based applications, uh, I, I, know, I, I don't know a whole lot about the experiments. I read about them, but some of them in particular, I think, were to help life on Earth in, area, in areas of agriculture and uh, air and water and, and making just general life on Earth uh, healthier and giving us better food supply and better um, better environment. I think that those are some uh, some things both on Axiom 4 but on other other experiments that we have as well on the space station that will help life here on Earth. I think for future uh, space exploration some of the biomedical experiments to understand how the human body reacts to space and how we can protect the human body from things like radiation, some of the hazards of space, I think will be very helpful. But uh, yeah, so I think that it's, it's a nice combination, as you pointed out, of doing things that will be helpful for us here on Earth, hopefully in the near term, um, but also for the future in exploration where how we can protect people and understand how the human body performs and can, be, can, can maintain healthy uh, in space. And I think learning how to do those things, keeping, the, keeping humans healthy in space also has uh, implications in spinoffs of how we can help with our health care here on Earth as well. Mike, you know, one question that's on everyone's mind is what can we take from a mission like Axiom 4 and take to a Gaganyaan mission, for instance? So please answer that for us. How will this experience, the knowledge gained from uh, Axiom 4 contribute to India's future humans uh, human space flight program? And I'm in particular talking about Gaganyaan. Well, I think, I, I, I think that this was a great way, uh, a great next step. Um, and the India has, a, a, I, I think, a lot of potential uh, in what they can do in space. They've accomplished a lot. I mean, certainly some of the amazing things they've gotten to do, launching their own rockets and landing on the, on these, uh, on the, on the moon uh, about a year or so ago. And that was uh, the, the rover uh, on the moon. Uh, just amazing accomplishments. And uh, the, the next step, getting people, uh, people to space, with the program that they're planning, I think that that's that's a wonderful program. I, I think that this was it's important to get people there, you know, to have that experience, to have an astronaut from India that experienced uh, two weeks in zero gravity, and, and it's not just the two weeks; it's also the training that is involved. And he, you know, that he was able to be um, trained with his other with his colleagues, with my very good friend, one of my very good friends, Peggy Whitson, was the commander of that mission, uh, the Axiom Four mission. She and I were astronaut classmates, and, and uh, wow. she's a yeah, terrific so astronaut. Yeah. I'm yeah. sure he learned a lot about space. She's a very experienced. She has more time in space than any other American, Peggy does, in history. So she has over, uh, uh, probably now about 680, getting close to 700 days in space, my friend does. So I'm sure she shared all of her experiences going through the training to fly on the space station, to fly on the SpaceX vehicle. Uh, so it's not just those two weeks in space. It's also the whole training process. I mean, and transferring that knowledge and understanding what it takes to get people ready to fly in space, to train them so they can be productive. And what you learn from the space flight itself, of course, is also very important. So I think now that that experience, India has that experience, that's going to make a big difference in what they're going to be able to do in the future in planning their space station and flying people in space. And I think also this was an international mission. And, and I hope that our countries continue to cooperate India and the United States and our other partners in the space station program. I hope all of us continue to, to, to cooperate and that we can do these great things together. What a beautiful message. Can you also tell us, Mike, and this is really something you can speak to, what are the difficulties? What comes? Because it's a very harsh environment out there. So how difficult is it to adapt to that when one is either entering space or coming back from space? Yeah, when you say the harsh environment, hopefully you're not exposed to that. <laughs> hopefully you're, you're protected from that, right? So a lot of bad things. You know, you're in the, the vacuum of space. We can't live in, in without air and pressure and so on. 
So, uh, but your spacecraft protects you from that. Uh, they didn't do any spacewalks, but if you go out to do a spacewalk, you know, your, your spacesuit protects you from that and also keeps you comfortable. So a lot of those harsh things, which are the, the vacuum of space, micrometeorite protection, you know, they have that on board the space station as well. Radiation protection, you're protected from that. So it's a really harsh environment, but hopefully your spacecraft protects you from all of that. The thing that they had to be probably most concerned about was zero gravity. And the, 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 being there for two weeks, um, you don't get a lot of the, uh, the effects of zero gravity long term if you did not exercise. So if you don't exercise in zero gravity, if you're there for a long period of time, a lot of bad things can happen. You can have muscle loss, bone loss, um, your heart can actually shrink. Those are, those are some bad things just by being in zero gravity. Um, but as long as you um, exercise, and again, being there for two weeks, even if you didn't do any exercise, you probably have a bit of a time readjusting, but certainly for longer stays, you have to exercise. I'm pretty sure this crew had a pretty good exercise regimen where they were exercising probably every day, trying to keep their bones and muscles strong. So I think as long as they did that, as long as they did what they were supposed to exercise wise, I think they protect themselves from some of those bad effects that can happen from space. And then hopefully the spacecraft protects you from all the other things like, like radiation and micrometeorite protection and, and give you a, a good atmosphere so that you can breathe and live normally. Okay, so you've spoken about the effect of zero gravity on muscle density, bone density, but what are the potential physical and psychological effects of the re-entry and the landing, the entire re-entry into the atmosphere part on these astronauts? How much of this is to do with the space flight duration? Yeah, the, so my missions on the space shuttle when I went to the Hubble Space Telescope it was similar in length to these missions. The mission that just concluded Axiom 4. I was there for 12 days and then for 14 days. And I did exercise every day. I did a couple spacewalks, and that certainly was a lot of exercise. But still coming back to Earth, I just felt like my balance was off a little bit. Your vestibular system, which is your inner ear that, that gives you your balance, works on gravity. And that doesn't, that's not working in space. So the brain does not incorporate that information after, after it, if it adapts to space. So now it's that information is now being presented to the brain again because the vestibular system's turned back on because you're at, you're on Earth and so your balance is off a little bit. So you can't drive a car or fly an airplane for a couple of days until you make sure everything's working again. Um, so I think that's some of the that's going to be some of the adaptation. But you mentioned about the length of the stay and the length of the rehabilitation period, the time to readapt to Earth is directly related to the amount of time you have in space. So two weeks, no, it's not so bad. A couple of days, a week, you'll be fine. But if you're up there for six months or so, it's it's quite different. It, it's a bigger adjustment. I've never experienced personally, but my, my friends who have have told me, and I've you know, observed what they go through, uh, that it's it's they're healthy. You know, there's nothing necessarily wrong with their health, but it's still an adaptation. You, you, you exercise in space, but that's different than exercising on the ground. You know, you don't have the same load, you don't have the same pounding of gravity all the time uh, that you have here on Earth. So that takes a little bit of time getting used to. And, you know, as you mentioned, the amount of time for readapting re re to the Earth is related to the amount of time you have in space. So this was, you know, a couple weeks, so it'll probably take me about a week or so to feel 100%, I would say. Maybe, maybe just a couple days they'll be able to drive and do other things. But when you're up there for six months, that's a that's a bit different. That that that's a that's a longer rehabilitation period to readapt to life on Earth. Okay, and Mike, tell us. I mean, we can really ask you this question now that Axiom Four has returned. Was there a point in this mission, either when it was going up, when it was in space, or when it was coming back down, where you had your fingers crossed? Yeah, I think you know it is always things that go wrong, and you know little experiments might. Little things, you know, things may not go exactly as planned, but you usually can adapt to those things. I didn't hear of anything major. As far as having my fingers crossed or hoping for them, I was I was hoping to see their launch. I was down there for the launch for four days back in early June, and it got moved to another week. So um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to stay and see my friends go to space. Um, but you always are concerned during a launch during the mission as well, you know, it's it's maybe prob probabil probability wise, it's safer, but it's also then the entry, you know, there's a few thousand degrees of heat 
as you re-enter the atmosphere. And uh, so you, you want to you wanna be hopeful then too and have your fingers crossed. So I think I, I constantly are wishing all my friends in space uh, good luck and, and are concerned about them and hope they're doing okay. But particularly during the launch and particularly during the entry, uh, that's probably the most, the, 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 the most concerning times. Those are the times where you're really hoping that everything goes well. Um, but it seemed like everything went really well for this crew. And uh, they're a great crew, and I uh, can't, can't wait to hear what they have to say about their mission. Especially because there was a significant delay in the launch. It happened twice that we had to wait and wait it out actually uh, for another date, and that's when we finally saw uh, the launch happen. But Mike, as a former NASA astronaut and educator, uh, what is the next space mission you've set your eyes on? We can't let you go before you answer that for us. Well, I'm really excited about the missions going back, uh, going to the moon. We're going back to the moon, meaning that we haven't sent people there in over 50 years. Mm. But I think that's the next big step for us uh, in exploration with people. Uh, we've had a lot of experience on space station. We got some more great experience with the Axiom 4 mission. Many more countries are getting involved. I think this is all great. We're learning a lot. And we've been operating in zero gravity on the International Space Station now for 25 years, it's going to be 25 years of having a continuous presence in low Earth orbit. Uh, but going to the moon and settling there and setting up a research station there uh, where we can have a continuous presence on the moon, that's a completely different story. It's a lot further away. You have to be more independent. You have to deal with dust and rocks and stuff like that and a little bit of gravity. And I think that's going to be a huge, a huge step. And that's what I'm looking forward to. And I think it's in not not so distant future. Um, you know, India had a great accomplishment landing their spacecraft on the moon. At, I guess it was about a year year or two ago. Um, and I look forward to to more of that sort of exploration. We're landing landing rovers and other equipment on the moon. We're, we're doing that. But I'm, I'm really looking forward to when we get people back on the moon. And I, I hope that that happens in the next few years. Okay, thank you for that, Mike, and uh, we will connect with you soon, especially if we do happen to get to that point in the next few months itself or perhaps a year or two. But that is time for us to head into a very short break. We're not done as yet. We'll be right back. Stay tuned.